evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Vasilios Bellos. Earlier this week, amid calls for his resignation over the Greenbelt debacle, Ontario's Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Steve Clark, was making funding announcements in Thunder Bay. Local NDP member Lise Vaujois weighed in on why the scandal matters here. If they can do it there, they can do it anywhere. Vaujois cautions that the legislative changes that made it possible to open up the Greenbelt to development could also be used to push through development here in the Northwest, which may not meet environmental standards or that would be supported by local residents. Here, there's a worry that, um, you know, gravel pits may be developed in communities that are basically housing or recreational communities and that, that the rules have been changed to make that easier. So it's not, the Greenbelt is not just something that's happening in southern Ontario because it matters to people up here too. And it should matter from the level of, of the corruption of a process and the benefiting of a very small group of people uh, through government policy. Bourgeois is concerned about the implications Bill 23, the Build More Homes Faster Act, could have here. And she worries new developments in the region may not undergo thorough environmental assessments under the same policies that allowed portions of the Greenbelt to be sold to developers. Leadership Thunder Bay has received a grant from the Ontario Trillium Foundation in support of their COVID-19 recovery efforts. Mayor Ken Boshkov and MPP Kevin Holland met with the group this past week at the 55 Plus Centre. This program has changed my course and direction in life. I don't know where I would be without this wonderful program. This year marks the 20th anniversary for Leadership Thunder Bay, and the group received nearly $33,000 in resiliency funding from Trillium. The grant has enabled Leadership Thunder Bay to continue its mission to develop, strengthen, and connect to the community. President of the organization, Deanna Walker, says the education programs they provide are essential to learning more about leadership strategies and having a wider understanding of the Thunder Bay community. So it is, uh, I think, imperative to our community. When I first came to Thunder Bay, I didn't have a true understanding of what went on in our community. And in 10 short months through Leadership Thunder Bay, I understood the whole fabric of our city. So I think it's an invaluable program, and I think it connects leaders within the, within the community and grows them at every level. Uh, really, we're in a time now, a lot of different times, and um, the changes in the leadership styles that we need and uh, really focusing on that is going to be an advantage to our community moving forward in, in graduating those leaders of the future. So. The $33,000 grant is being used for marketing, branding, and staff realignment for Leadership Thunder Bay, as well as three new community action projects within the city. Another Northwestern First Nation once again has safe drinking water. Wapsamoong Independent First Nation had a boil, boil water advisory in effect for more than one year, and it was lifted last month. Local MP Patty Haidu, who also serves as the Minister of Indigenous Services, says credit for this accomplishment also falls on the community. And I want to congratulate the chief and council in particular. It can be really hard to lift a boil water advisory. Communities uh, often don't trust the water, even when it's testing clean. It's uh, especially for long-term boil water advisories. People have to be uh, really feeling certain that the water coming out of their taps is clean. And that's a testament to the chief and council and their work to give that community the safety that they need to be able to lift the water advisory. The boil water advisory was put in place in July of last year after higher than normal turbidites were detected in the community's water treatment system. Repairs were completed in May of this year, leading to reports that potable service water service had been restored to the community. Haidu says this is part of a grander federal commitment to ensure all boil water advisories can be lifted. The money is sufficient to get the job done. We've lifted about 74% of all boil water advisories. Yeah, well over 100 uh, boil water advisories when we took office. Canadians can follow along. There's a website, Indigenous Services Canada hosts, that will show you exactly the stage of the water treatment plant uh, development. Most communities are either in construction or are waiting for Chief and Council to have that confidence to lift the boil water advisory. And there are a few that are still in the feasibility stage trying to figure out exactly how to service their population. Despite some delays, progress has continued with the development of a port in Red Rock Township on the former mill site. And the, the, they now believe the pro apologies, they now project the port could be active next summer. Lee Noonan was on site and has this report. When the plan to open a commercial port at the former mill site in Red Rock was announced in March, 
Hopes were high that the refurbishment of the old pier would begin this fall. Although that's been delayed now, site supervisor Jesse Oatman still feels good about their progress so far. We should have everything that we wanted to be complete by the end, middle of November this year. Besides, the port project has not begun, setbacks there, but other than that, we are on schedule. Red Rock Deputy Mayor Gordon Muir says it was hard at first for longtime residents to watch the last remnants of the mill coming down, but that now things are getting exciting. It was tough for them to see. They, many years, this, this mill kept this township going. Um, I think at this point now, when they've seen the progress here, I've, I've was able to take a, a tour myself and uh, the, the progress they're making here and the plans they have, are it's amazing and uh, it will revitalize this town. Despite the delays with the construction of the pier itself, work is moving forward on other aspects of the site and Oatman says the port could see its first ships next summer. It's hard to get contractors in so we're, I think we're doing quite well. We're ready for construction on the, on the port in the spring so that's a win and the rail is, should be out by the end of the month for assessing to put the new rail back in. Eventually new rail will connect the port to the CP line. Meanwhile, construction of the road to the future pier site is finished and significant progress is being made on environmental cleanup. It was an old mill site, so what, what we're bumping into is a lot of different processes of a, a bunker sea waste uh, contaminated with rainwater and groundwater and you know a, a lot of stuff like that. So. What we try to do is, is we take off the liquid first, we try to get it into a solid, then we solidify it and then test it to make sure that uh, it's not hazardous and, and non-regulated. Hyde says it'll be another four to six weeks remediating the last two tanks standing here and that they'll be here for at least a few years as work is ongoing and more waste is discovered. Lee Noonan, TBT News. Staying in Red Rock, where a new house is going up in the town for the first time in decades. For the township, it represents not just a new residence, but the start of what many hope is a new trend of growth and prosperity. The three-bedroom single-family home going up on Rankin Street is the first new build since the early 80s, according to Deputy Mayor Gord Muir. He's confident the house will be the first of many residential projects coming to the municipality. It means a lot. It's... Uh, it's it's groundbreaking actually like the, one of the biggest things that we have here is a town that can hold a lot of people and and this is the start of bringing people to our town and growing it and expanding we have a lot to offer we're one hour from the city we're one hour from the, the bush we're right on the beautiful lake uh, lake superior the beautiful most beautiful lake in the world we have everything to offer here so we're hoping that this brings a lot of people to town and we can, you know, see the kids running down the street and, and we see the hockey teams picking back up and the rec center booming, the waterfront booming. It's, it's, it's the start of something great. Construction is expected to be completed and the house listed by late December or early January. The developer, another BMI, BMI Group subsidiary Red Rock Development, is also working on converting a commercial building in Red Rock into an 11-unit residential building with construction slated to begin in November. And finally, despite the scorching heat, residents from all over the region made their way to the village of Heimers for a popular Labor Day weekend tradition. The Heimers Fall Fair has been celebrating the area's agricultural roots with food, markets, and entertainment for 111 years. Jessica Clement reports. A Labor Day weekend tradition that's been going on for over 100 years, the annual Heimers Fall Fair kicked off on Sunday. Setting itself as a true annual country fair, the two-day event features a number of activities, including animal shows, crafts exhibits, and contests. Sunday's scorching conditions presented some challenges, including the cancellation of a couple activities, but hundreds of attendees still came out to celebrate the area's agricultural roots. Heimer's Agricultural Society President Aaron LaForest says it's amazing to see all the support. Just that love for the fair it keeps it going. We're strictly an agricultural fair, and... Uh, and it's just, it's really wonderful, you know, without a midway, without a beer gardens, we, we still manage to get lots of people out here that just truly love that homegrown, get down to earth agriculture. Along with the livestock shows and agricultural exhibits, the fair has a long lineup of musicians and entertainers who will be playing on the two stages over the long weekend. Me 
Forest says Heimer's Fair wouldn't be possible without the over 200 volunteers helping out. This includes Diana Bacchus, who has been volunteering at Heimer's for over four decades. My husband and I started in 1982. Uh, I've gone all through all the ranks, all the way through, like been up to president, past president, and now I'm a volunteer. My husband does other things, and uh, it's a great fair. Bacchus says it's the camaraderie that brings her back year after year. It's the people. It's the people that make the fair. It's the people. It's the food. It's uh, getting to see people you... Everyone comes to Heimer's Fair to see the people they haven't seen for a whole year. So everybody meets everybody here. Everybody here loves each other, is very kind to each other. They bring homegrown things and lots of fun and family times together. It's just, it's really, it's really family orientated. The fall fair festivities will continue on Monday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Jessica Clement, TBT News. Just a great yearly event. We're now joined by Sports.